that she's working on, and it's joy, 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 okay? And then Caleb's going to come and lead us in some praise and worship, and and uh, so we want to go ahead and, and get started. So, Emlyn, take it away. Well, welcome to Sunday Night Church, everybody. Um, before we start, I'm going to read a little passage from uh, Revelation 7, uh, starting with verse, t- verse 13. It says, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to them, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them into white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and and night in his temple and he who sits on the throne will, will shelter them with his presence Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hand, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, Upward I look and see him there, who made an end of all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied. To look on him and pardon me. To look on him and pardon me. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one risen son. Of God. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One in himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and 
my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the one risen Son of God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the one risen Son of If you guys would stand and join me in singing Nothing But the Blood, hymn number 135. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing verse 4. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow.
Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in Him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow, he washed it white as snow, he washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lamb. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet 
of Jesus, and we cry, holy, 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 we cry, holy, 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 we cry, holy, 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 is the Lamb. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to The greatness of his mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. God, thank you so much um, for this day, for this time that you've given us to worship you. Um, help, help Cole as he speaks your word. Um, fill him with the spirit tonight. Help us to understand what he has to say. This is all in your name we pray. Amen. Good evening. Good evening. All right. So before we get started, I just wanted to say something about last week's message. Um, last week, I said a personal statement, and I just want to apologize for that because there was no scripture to back that up. But I just want to say that because um, it is what I think, but... I want to let you know I shouldn't have said it from the pulpit, and I apologize for that. Um, the pulpit is a place for speaking the word of God in truth, and uh, I didn't do that last week, so I apologize for that and ask for your forgiveness in that. But um, as we get started, we're going to be in Matthew uh, chapters 27 and 28 as we go through it. And just to kind of recap over the last two times I've got to teach you all, um, we've been talking about um, ultimately our relationships with God ourselves, that inner peace within us, with others and the world. And uh, as we learned from the first week, um, those are the four things we were created for, those four relationships. But as we talked about last week, that the fall has broken the connection to every single one of those. So there are kind of two, three things I wanna, want us to get at tonight. Um, one, that we, we are created for a, relation, a personal relationship with God, ourselves, others in the world, but because of the fall, we're broken. But as we also talked about in Genesis 3.15, God had a plan to restore us to himself and all those other things with us. Um, and we also discussed how ultimately those other three, the inner peace with ourselves, with others in the world, all come from our relationship with God. And that's ultimately the one thing that needs to be restored. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So as we're going into it, we're going to start in verse 45 of chapter 27. And at this point, this is Jesus hanging on the cross. He has, as you, if you go back and read all of chapter 27, um, you know, they go through Pilate and, you know, the whole trial and stuff. And, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are plotting against him. And then at this point where we're picking up, this is where he is hanging on the cross. So we'll start in verse 45. 
Now from the sixth hour there was a darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lima shabbatani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them ran at once and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So as we go into that, um, just a little bit of a reference. In verse 46, when Jesus is crying, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? He's actually quoting Psalms 22. Um, and there's a whole other part of that can go to that. If you actually want to know about all that, you can go talk to Dawson. He's, he's pretty well educated on that. But I just wanted to throw that in there. But um, Jesus is crying out in this, saying that this psalm is being fulfilled. It's, um, it's a messianic, prophetic psalm. And Jesus is just crying, hey, this psalm is being fulfilled in this. But what I really want to look at right now is verse 15. It said, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Um, so the first thing we learn from this is that this is Jesus yielding his spirit to the will of the Father. Um, as we remember in Genesis 3.15, it said, I will put amenity between you and the woman and and." The descendant of Eve, sorry, I'm going to paraphrase. He will bruise your hill or crush your head, and he, I'm sorry, he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. And all that saying is, hey, that this is, Jesus yielding up his spirit is the bruising of the hill, that Jesus had to die for our sins. And two things are happening at this moment. He's yielding to the will of God in that. The wrath of God has to be poured out on him for the atonement of sins. If the wrath of God isn't poured out on him, his blood is meaningless. There's no atonement for our sins. But thankfully, Jesus is yielding to the Father, and he's paying for our sins and yielding to the will of the Father. Because the wrath of God is something we don't talk about a lot in the American church. But it's so important understanding a good biblical theology. If we don't understand the wrath of God and its severity, I, don't, I think we're going to miss the mark on what Jesus' death really did. Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He took on the wrath of God. Everything, that, any sinful thing that has ever been done by every single human being that has ever lived and will ever live was paid for in that moment. That's a lot of sin, but he took it in that moment. So, this is, so the yielding is the bruising of his heel. And then we're going to look at verses 51 through 54. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rock split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the satyrian and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake that took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this is... The, or was the son of God. So as we go from that, we see in verse 50, Jesus is yielding to the will of the father. He's giving up his spirit. He's dying. His blood is shed, the atoning blood. And then immediately as that happened, it said, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. So as soon as Jesus died, our relationship to God was restored. So, the curtain it's referring to here is the curtain in the Holy of Holies. And this is where it was, you know, the presence of God dwelled for the Israelites. And because of that, um, this is where you came, you know, once a year. They would send the high priest and do the ultimate sacrifice before the presence of God. But because of Jesus' blood, not the, the blood of man, but ultimately the, the blood of the Son of God, it atoned for our sins. So as soon as Jesus died, we, we, our relationship with God is restored. So that's our first point. Our relationship is restored. And, it's a, and I like how in this text, how Matthew puts it, and behold. You know, behold is a word that means to hold on to. Hold on to this. We're supposed to hold on to the fact that Jesus' blood opened up the presence of God to us so that we can be restored to it. 
And as we keep going through that, um, it also reminds us that nothing on heaven or on earth can separate us from God's presence. God is here in this room right now. He's in some of our hearts. He He's everywhere. And I know that's kind of a weird thing to think that in their times that God was just confined to that one space. But that's where he was, his ultimate presence. But now we know he ultimately lives in us. So we're going to actually jump down to chapter 28 now, verse 1. It, but in those passages in between, for those of us who are familiar with it, um, you know, Jesus is buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, and uh, the women that were with Jesus uh, cleaned his body, wrapped him up, and they sealed him in the tomb. And then also the uh, Pharisees go to Pilate, and they're like, hey, we need guards there. And they're like, hey, this is your problem. You take care of it. So the Jews send out uh, guards to guard the tomb to make sure nobody could even take Jesus' body and spread, you know, what they might think would be a lie that he's resurrected. But as we look in 28, it says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was, light, was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and they will see me. So as, as we go through this, um, I kind of want to hone in on verses 5 and 7 right now. And it's the angel speaking to Mary Magdalene, the other Mary. And in this, he says, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the, his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. This is the angel telling us Genesis 3.15 has been fulfilled. This is the second part of it. The first part of Jesus dying, the bruising of the hill, his own death. That's the, the fulfillment of the second half. This is the angel telling us the first half has been fulfilled, that he has crushed the head of Satan. Evil is over. This is telling us, hey, we are completely restored as God intended us to be from the beginning. God made a way to be redeemed and restored to him. <clears throat> In verse 7, the word behold, it has the word behold again. And this means that we should hold on to this. Like we should hold on to that the curtain was torn from top to bottom. We should hold on to the fact always that Jesus is risen. It's not like he just rose once and then like he died again. He's still alive and he's going to come again. And we just, our ultimate and most our Ultimate and most important relationship is fulfilled because of those in Christ. We are restored to God. And because we're restored with God, we're restored in ourselves now. We found that inner peace with us. But it's not that we went and found the peace. The peace came and found us. Um, there's no we way we could have ever found peace on our own. But the ultimate peace came and found us. So as we remember that, let's uh, pick up in verse 16 of chapter 28. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold... I am with you always till the end of the age. And this is kind of where I really want to settle in and talk for a little bit is as uh, we've seen the, the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 that 
Jesus died, he's raised, and now we can have a restored relationship with him. But then we get into this next part. So in verse 10, Jesus told them to go to Galilee. In verse 16, they went to Galilee. And then verse 17, it says that they worshiped, but some doubted. And I think it's interesting because it's not like Jesus didn't know they weren't doubting. It's not like he was just standing there, like taking in all the worship and just like not noticing that they doubted or like had some type of contempt or like what it, what is going on. But he knew exactly what was going on. But the text doesn't tell us that he even addressed their doubt. Instead, he just gives them the command. As most of us, you know, we know this is referred to the Great Commission. God didn't address their doubts. And this is just a little side tangent. A lot of times in our life, when we have doubts in our own life, we just think, hey, if I just keep pursuing and asking God, he's going to give me the answer. I mean, that might happen. But not always. I think it's fair to say that um, when we have doubts in our life, we just keep pursuing what God has called us to do. And I'm not saying like we have to take an ignorant view and that we can't try to answer those questions or ask God to answer those questions for us. But sometimes we just overthink. And I think that's what Jesus is. He knows what his disciples are going through. If I talk to them, you know, it might just make it worse. But he said, but instead he just gave us the command. And then it picks up in verse 18. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And I know a lot of times when we talk about the Great Commission, we always, we always focus on verses 19 and 20. We don't really talk a lot about verse 18, but I love this verse. It's, it's just such a great comfort to me. All authority. Man, sometimes we forget Jesus has authority in our lives so many times. And... It's, it's on his authority he's sending us out. It's on his authority that we're able to come to him, go to the throne of God. That's how we're able to even stand in his presence. And I just love that verse. But then in verse 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, unpopular opinion, but we're not just called to say be vessels to save and convert people. We're called to make disciples. Pastor West talked about it this morning. We we're, we're supposed to go and not saying we're not supposed to be vessels to save people, but it's so much more than that. We're supposed to teach them how to follow Jesus. And not just people that are like us, that share our same political views, that have the same color of our skin, but for everybody, he says, of all nations. Uh, in America, we've kind of bought into this lie that and I'm not trying to call our church out or anything, but there are a lot of people in America that believe Jesus is only for white people, that Jesus is white. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Jesus was Jewish. He's not white. He didn't have the color of my skin. He wasn't all pasty like me. He, <laughs> but um, and there's also this lie that, you know, G Jesus is, you know, Jesus is a Democrat or Jesus is a Republican or Jesus is neither. <laughs> He didn't live in our times. <laughs> so Jesus is not just, we, we, we shouldn't be believing in the Republican or Democrat Jesus. We should just be believing in Jesus of the Bible. And I think everything else will solve that. We can't put our trust in political affiliations or authorities or our own race. Like, this is what we're called to do because the gospel is for all people, not people just like us. And I think that's just such an encouraging message, especially as we you know, have the, the one that we're trying to, you know, get started here. And I'm not saying, like, if you don't find someone that's not like you, like, you you failed. But I'm just saying, are we keeping our eyes open to that possibility? Because there are people, even in McLeod and Shawnee, that don't look or think like us. And we should be reaching them just as equally as the people that do. So as we keep going on, <clears throat> excuse me, then after we're, we we save them and we're teaching them the ways. The first thing we do is the first step of obedience is to baptize them in the, name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you weren't here this morning, I would encourage you to go back and listen to Pastor Wes's message. It was it was great this morning. Just I was really convicted by it and just how we um we're called to, you know, make disciples and baptize them. That's the first step of obedience. And just from that, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So, you know, just that emphasis, again, we're to make disciples, teach them how to be. 
And what's that first step to be to looking like a Christian? It's baptism as we keep going on. And this is where I really want to settle in for the night. And I'm so excited. It's in verse 20, the second half, and it says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Um, there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people that would believe that, um, you know, God is far off. God is distant. But for those of us that have Christ, God is near. He's in you. Because he says, and behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. And that, again, it's that word behold. It's used three times in the last few verses that we've used. And this is the final one. And behold, I am with you always. That's just a great comfort to me that God is never going to leave me or anybody that is his son or daughter. He's never going to leave. He's always going to be there. He's always with us. And we're supposed to hold on to that. For everywhere we are, we need to keep hold to remember, Jesus is with me. He is with me. And not just saying this because we can, like, induct it, but, like, he said it, I'm with you. And then always to the end of the age. So from beginning to end, he is with you. He is always there. And he will always be there until he comes again. So as we kind of close, I just kind of want to draw it up like this. As we've seen the atoning blood of Jesus' death and resurrection redeems us to our relationship with God. Because he he redeemed and restored us, we are also restored in ourselves. So we now have that inner peace. And with that inner peace, we are to take the gospel to all people. And it is by the power of of the gospel of Christ Jesus, we can be restored to one another. But what about our relationship to the world? And I know I didn't really get to mention this, but all I know is that in Revelation it said Jesus is going to come again, and then the whole world will be restored and redeemed to himself because he, he's the world's creator. Why would it not be restored to him? So it is, but it is also to come. And with all that in mind, we can rest in the creation, fall, and redemption story of the Bible and that it is always true, because this is the word of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> so with that, I'd just like to take a moment, and uh, I just want to give you all a minute to just reflect, because I know a lot of us in this room have relationships with Christ, but do we ever just rejoice in that story? It's the greatest story the world has ever known. It's more than a story. It's the word of God, and it's the power to save, the power and the word of Jesus Christ. That is that just blows my mind. So I just want to take a moment and have everyone bow their, bow their heads, close their eyes, and just reflect for a moment and just think of how beautiful that story is that we were created for a relationship with him, with others, with the world, and within ourselves. But we messed it up. But in that, he still redeemed us to himself because he sent his son Jesus and fulfilled and said and did what he was go- said he was going to do. So with that, just take a moment and reflect on that. Father God, just thank you for this evening. Thank you for uh, the opportunity and privilege just to go through your word together, Lord, as a congregation. Um, I just ask and pray that we would always remember this story and it be at the forefront of our hearts, our minds, and our souls, God, that we are broken creatures created for a relationship with you. And God, we couldn't do that on our own, but you came and did it for us, that you sent your only son and the in our form so that we might be reunited with you and have a personal intimate relationship and from that you gave us the mission to take this gospel this good news to the whole world so that others could be restored to you and with one another and with the world father god just thank you so much for your son jesus and it's all because of him we're able to even gather here today father god i just ask and pray that this message would be rich on our hearts minds and in our souls that we would uplift you every day with an attitude of thanksgiving and gratefulness for your grace and mercy. And we pray this all in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
Y'all are dismissed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>